Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I see that we are 70 people now in. We expect a few more, but we will start uh, slowly on this workshop. So I'm happy that all of you are here. Uh, it will be an exciting day. Uh, also technical wise for us. It's the first time we run this uh, for the GIS and maps topic uh, online. Uh, so, uh, just a quick introduction. I, most of you also follow the, um, the webinar we had in, back in March, so you already know me. Uh, I just want to add that um, it's great that I'm as a developer, so I'm working full time on developing the Maps app of DHS2, and it's, I think it's a great privilege to be able to talk to our users directly. Uh, it's a great way to get a feedback and also today because we would like you to do the exercises on your own DHS2 instance, it will be a very good test of the system of how the Maps app works in different, uh, with different setups. So I really hope that you also use this opportunity to give us feedback, both if you discover bugs, I really hope it won't be too many. Uh, we do a lot of testing of bugs on our own instance but some bugs are hard to discover because it's, it's directly linked to different setups. So if you find, if something breaks, something don't work, please uh, report it to us. And at the same time, or, and also uh, if there are missing features, if there are something you would like to show on the map, read, uh, be able to click on uh, everything that would be nice to have, please give us the feedback. And, and we will try to, if there is enough demand, we will try to add it. It's a continuous effort and we, we add new features in every release and we try to, to meet the demand of our users. So I've worked on the Maps app uh, full-time now for, uh, for about five years and will continue in the years to come. Uh, about you, um, some of you have started to introduce yourself in the Slack channel. I will show you shortly, but if you have access to Slack already, please just add a few lines about uh, yourself. It's really nice just to see, see who you are, although we, we can't meet in person. Uh, there has been a lot of registrations for this, uh, this um, workshop, which is very good. Uh, so we have more than 200 registrations. We don't expect all of you to show up. Some of you might sit by the same uh, computer uh, and some might watch the recording afterwards. But uh, from the registrations, there are people from 66 countries which are mouse, uh, marked on this map, mostly Africa and Asian, uh, Asian countries. So this is the plan for today. I know that you are all in different time zones. So this is the Central European time in Oslo. Right now it's, uh, it's uh, 10 minutes past 10 and we are in the introduction. So this workshop will last for three hours until one o'clock uh, Central European time. And then right after from one until two, as long as there are questions, will be available uh, also here on Zoom to answer and Slack and answer any questions you might have. Uh, in the, yeah, so this is a bit different from the webinar we had back in March. So if you would like uh, a more general introduction to the Maps app, I would advise you to, to look at the uh, demo, the, the recording from the webinar that we made. Uh, we will also have some short presentations today, but the focus is on you, the, as this is a workshop, so you will need to do some work. <laughs> so we have four exercises planned and one extra that you might do on your own. So uh, we will spend some time on this today. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, we would like you to use your own DHS2 instance. So we have made all the exercises in a way that they can be applied to any DHS 
instance. But some of the features you need to use requires a certain version of, of DHS2. So it might be if you are an old version that you cannot do all the exercises. And for this reason, we have also uh, created a workshop instance just for this workshop that you can use, which is running DHS-235. And this is also posted on Slack, so you will find it there. But if you can't do the exercises on your own instance, you can use this workshop instance. Uh, as there are so many participants, we don't plan to have any hand-ins. Uh, so to get a certificate, you need to follow all the sessions. We expect you also to do the exercises, but we won't control the exercises. And to be able to sort of figure out that you have actually followed the workshop, I will say a quote, some words in one of the sessions today that you need to write down and, and mention uh, in a form to get the certificate. So I will tell you this loud and clear, uh, but uh, I won't tell you when. <laughs> so you need to follow on the sessions between the exercises. Uh, even though we don't have a hand in, we, use, we still want to get feedback and I will show you later how this will be, will be done. So this is our Slack channel. I hope everyone have access. If you don't have access, uh, please tell us in the Zoom chat. You should also find some link in the Zoom chat now uh, to the Slack channel. So it's very important that you have this Slack uh, access and open. Uh, there is one announcement channel where we will tell you important information from the instructors. And then there is a questions channel for you to ask questions for us and fellow participants. And then we have one channel for each exercise. And while you are doing the exercise, this is not some, something you need to do, but it would be very nice if you can share feedback while you are doing the exercises. If you, you can show your result or you, you can tell us if you have trouble doing some of your exercises. And then we, it would be very nice if everyone could write, just write a few lines about yourself. It's a great uh, feedback for us as well to know who you are and, and what you're working on and, and so on. So, so please do that. I will just quickly demo the Slack. So this is the Slack workspace. Uh, please go to introduce yourself now and just write a few, a few lines. Uh, it's also nice if you add a picture and your full name, but it's not required. Uh, and then this is the announcements channel. So during the day, we will post uh, announcements here. So this is where you will find, for example, the, the form uh, to get the certificate where you need to, to fill out the, the quote for the day. Uh, and then we also have this, for each exercise, there is a channel. And I see even some of you were really eager to start. So I posted this last night, the, all the exercises are here and some of you even replied uh, uh, yesterday. So this is just, I think it's nice how you have all, some of you have already started. Uh, post the results, uh, post some screen drive from the Maps app. This is not a requirement, but it's, it's great for us to, to, to get this feedback. So please continue to, to do this. So, Let's start with a definition. So, uh, so far in this, we have mainly talked about maps. Now we are going to make a little broader view and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about GIS, which maps is a part of. So, so a GIS, the, the previously the maps application in DHS2 will call, was called the GIS app. We decided to remove this for two reasons. One is that GIS is a more technical term and not everybody 
knows about it, but most people know what, what a map is. And also because GIS is a much broader term, while the Maps app is basically about sh sh uh, making maps and showing maps. So GIS stands for Geographic Information System. Uh, if you're studying GIS, it will often, the meaning will often be science instead of system. So geographic information science. So I have a master in geographic information science uh, at the University of Edinburgh. And it's defined as a computer system for capturing, storing, checking, and displaying data related to positions on the Earth's surface. And what's important to mention here is that on the Maps app is only focusing on displaying data for, of these four. But so in a way we can look upon the whole DHS2 ecosystem of software as a GIS because you will use other uh, like the Android app for capturing events which might have a coordinate. You will use our database where we also have a database called Hope GIS, which is especially GIS database, uh, where we store the data. There are other tools that will help you to check and validate the data. And then at the end, we have the map app to display the data. And also still in this uh, workshop, we will focus on the display of data because th that is most useful for most of you. Uh, also, as I mentioned in the webinar, you, we have these um, you have these possibilities or these special capabilities of GIS is that you can add different information layers on top of each other uh, on a single map. So the map app is built around this notion, uh, and you can kind of mix this lay different layer type as you like, uh, and this allows us to to see and understand patterns and relationships. That's why we created maps, because we want to see, uh, understand why is there a, a higher, something more of my, higher levels in one part of the country or the other. And then you can maybe add another layers to could help you explain why this is happening. Uh, so far the maps app is mostly about seeing, but uh, I will show you later uh, at the end of the day how we have added more analyze capabilities into the Maps app in the last release. And also, the, uh, tomorrow we are going to use a GIS program called QGIS. And that will focus on analyzing data and also how you can combine different layers with each other to see, if there, to see the connection. Oops. Uh, so now I will hand over to, to Austin. Do you need to share something or can I just keep this slide? No, you can just keep this slide. That's fine. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin McGee. I am uh, happy to be here with you today, uh, helping with Bjorn to uh, introduce the Maps application and some uh, visualization and analysis of geographic data, um, and particularly geographic data for health, which is what DHS2 is very good at. Um, a little bit about me. My background is um, in software engineering. I've been uh, also working in the NGO space um, around water, particularly. Um, in Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda previously, before coming to DHS2 about two and a half years ago. Uh, and now I focus on uh, building some things like the uh, application platform for DHS2, um, which allows people to extend DHS2 to other systems um, uh, to, to adapt to their local environments. Um, and just going go, to go over this very quickly, because we're already uh, pushing our time a little bit. Um, but I wanted to give a quick introduction to G GIS or maps or geographic data and health uh, and a little bit of the history of that. Uh, it wouldn't be a workshop on um, GIS or, uh, or geographic data for health without talking about John Snow. Um, who is known as um, the father of epidemiology. Um, 
there are, there's some debate about if he actually is, but he, he has become known as the, the father of epidemiology. Um, and who, who was Jon Snow? So Jon Snow was a, a, a person in uh, London um, during a, a major cholera outbreak um, where this was a, in a time before they knew that uh, diseases were transmitted because of microorganisms like bacteria or viruses. Um, and so there wasn't a, a concept of epidemiology as we know it today. Um, and what Jon Snow did was he looked uh, at through the, um, uh, the data that he saw coming in every day from this cholera outbreak in London. And the, the, the common theory at the time for, from the, the health professionals was that uh, this was the cholera was coming from um, dirty air, basically. So they thought that pollution was causing uh, cholera. Um, and so they were trying to clean up the air as much as possible. Uh, and in doing so, we're, we're tossing a bunch of things into the river, for instance, rather than releasing it into the air, which was problematic. Um, and so what Jon Snow was able to do was look at all of the places where there were cholera cases, put them onto a map, which was one of the first times that someone had done this, put them onto a map and try to figure out what they had in common. So if you look at the map that's on your screen right now, you can see that all the red dots are cases of cholera. Uh, and you, you can also see in uh, marked in blue here are all of the water taps, the, the, the pumps where people were getting water out of the ground. Um, and you'll notice if you, if you look at this visually, and this is one of the, the, the things that John Snow did for the first time um, uh, in, in the world was that if you look at Look at the, the pattern here. You'll see that all of these red dots in this particular area are clustered around one of these blue pumps. Um, and so they had no idea that diseases could be transmitted through water, through microorganisms like bacteria or viruses. Um, but this information and presenting the data in this way on a map was enough to convince the city council to actually take the handle off of that pump, which then helped to basically eliminate that uh, source of cholera in the, for this particular epidemic. Um, they later were able to dis determine that, their, that cholera is a, a microorganism that's transmitted through water most commonly. It's not transmitted through the air. Um, but even without knowing that, looking at this information on a map was able to help solve this big outbreak of cholera in London. Um, so this is something that uh, just to keep in mind as we're, we're looking at a lot of kind of technical things about maps and presenting information is that it can actually be used in a very, um, uh, in a very kind of powerful way to address real, real problems in particularly health around the world and it has been for a very long time. So just wanted to give a little bit of a quick history, introduce myself, and uh, we'll turn it back over to Bjorn for uh, the next part of the workshop. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, these are our maps uh, releases. Uh, so I just want to mention this again. Uh, we, I won't spend too much time on it, but just that you know that we have added new features uh, as we move ahead. So depending on your version, there might be uh, some features that you don't have support for. And we will try to mention that in the exercises. And then as mentioned also, uh, if this feature is not supported on your instance, you please use our workshop instance instead to try the exercise. Uh, the first uh, exercise is, we start easy. It's about uh, checking out the different base maps we support and also use some of the, the map tools. So I will just give you a, a very quick recap from, from the webinar we had before the, the exercise. So this is the base maps we provide. There might be others in earlier version, but from 235, these are the one we support. So we have a light version, which is the default one, which we recommend as a background for your thematic layers because it don't it don't clutter your map it may still makes it easy to read and put the emphasis on on your layers and then there is a more detailed open street map layer uh, which have much more names and roads and buildings and so on so if you need to see the detail or find your street this is this is the one you can use 
And then in addition, we have some layers from Bing Maps, especially useful is the satellite imagery, which is very nice, very good for, for large parts of the, of the world. Uh, one of the tasks is that you are going to find your own town or even your house if possible. So you just need to navigate the map. You can use the, the zoom buttons here, uh, or you can also just double click the map or even the, the scroll wheel zoom to zoom in and out. And then you can drag the map around. This is as you Google Maps and others mapping application, just the same for the HS2 maps to, to locate uh, your house. Uh, then we also have the search tool, which is the magnifier button. So we would like you to test this search uh, tool for your own country and try some bigger and smaller places in your own country and give us some feedback if you're able to find the places. So this will give, you some, give us some feedback if, if the search is good enough or we should maybe try to look for, for a better uh, searching tool. This is also based on OpenStreetMap. So often if you, the name is shown on OpenStreetMap, uh, it should also show in this search. Uh, lastly, I think the, this is the measurement tool, which is this ruler icon, which you can use to measure both distances, distances and areas. And we have an exercise for this uh, uh, just now. And then also I want to explain now the difference between latitude and longitude. Some people, some of you might know this, but we use latitude and longitude at, as the coordinate format in DHS2. The reason is that this is, DHS2 is used all over the world. And this is a shared global format that can position, uh, that pushes, position anything all over the world. So it's a good generic system uh, to use. Very often your own country might have coordinates in like a national coordinate system. And then you need to translate into latitude and longitude before you can enter the coordinate on DHS in DHS2. So knowing latitude and longitude and the difference between them is a bit uh, important. So latitude uh, goes from west to, no, sorry, longitude goes from west to east. Uh, so by the prime meridian that goes through Greenwich in London is zero longitude. And then if you move eastwards, it compared to this map, <laughs> uh, you will have a positive longitude number. And then on this side, you will have a negative longitude number. It goes up to plus 180 and minus 180. And then the latitude goes from north to south. So zero is the equator. Above the equator, it's a positive latitude number up to 90 at the North Pole. And then a negative number below the equator down to the south pole. So just by knowing in which sort of hemisphere you are, you can sometimes tell the difference what is longitude and that latitude. So if you are in this part of Africa, your longitude numbers will be positive and uh, your latitude numbers will be negative. And I've added one here for the Victoria Falls. Oops. Uh, so you can see one number is with a minus, and then that should be, will be the, the latitude number. And the positive should be the longitude. So before we have been not very good, sometimes we just showed like type to coordinate. And I see, and we didn't really specify what should be first and last. So now whenever we try to do something new, with coordinates, we always specified what is longitude and what is latitude, so you don't mix them up. But often, if you can't find your health facility on the map, it is useful to so, sort of think that it's the, it's the wrong way around. So instead of here, Victoria Falls might be placed out here in the, in the Atlantic. 
usually also you don't need more than six decimals in these uh, the, in these numbers because that is the meter position and for our use cases that is usually uh, enough so you will i also share this slide on the uh, on slack uh, under the exercise so you can have a look at it there just also to mention there is uh, lots of when you don't have the coordinates, I see some of you type 0, 0.0. Uh, and there are even some coordinates like that in the demo database. And since 0, 0.0, it's actually a valid coordinate, coordinate. So you should rather leave it empty than typing 0, 0.0. And so many people do this all over the world. So people have named this imaginary place, the Null Island. It's in the middle of the ocean. This is the only thing that is there but there is tons of health facilities, schools, kindergartens, everything uh, at this location. So if you Google Null Island, you will find it's like a whole internet community, travel agencies, everything uh, for it. So, so that's another place to look for, for misplaced uh, health facilities. Lastly, you, you can click anywhere on the map and then uh, select show longitude and latitude and that will display the coordinates uh, of that place so we have one task uh, for you to find the latitude and longitude of your hometown or, or home uh, building so this is the exercise uh, i will just uh, i will go through them very quickly here i won't demo it but i will go through them afterwards uh, so you are going to try yourself first. So the first task is that you're going to find where you live on the map. You can either zoom in or try to search for it using the search tool. Uh, and then find the latitude and longitude of your building. Then we would like you to try the search, place search and just search for some small and bigger places and see if you are able to find them, please give us feedback if, if uh, you are not able to find them or, or are. Then in the search field, you can also paste in a coordinate. So we would like you to take this coordinate and paste it into the search field and see where, you, where, where it will take you. Uh, and also answer which is longitude of those two two numbers. You should see that after, you can't see it from here, but you should see it after when it's shown on the map. Then we would like you to use the measurement tool to find the distance between your town or neighborhood and the capital, or if you are within the capital already from your building to the parliament building. And lastly, if you can turn on the satellite imagery for the showing the parliament building and measure the size of the building. These are usually quite huge. Uh, and then uh, at the end, if you like, you can post a screenshot of this measurement to, to the Slack channel. So as mentioned, this is uh, day one exercise. You will find the, uh, the um, exercise I just mentioned here as well. Uh, you have 15 minutes, we're running a little bit late already, but we will uh, take it back. Um, so you have 15 minutes. Uh, so to 10 to, to, yeah, 15 minutes from now, and then we will go through it together. So good luck with the exercise. Bjorn, there was one just quick question that might be irrelevant here. Um, mm -hmm which was about being able to do, especially this exercise, but some of the other exercises as well in a version that isn't 235. Um, and I think the answer I put on Slack, but just wanted to share with everyone here is that at least for this first exercise, um, uh, there was one mention of 233 version. This, this should all be possible in the 233 version. So feel free to do that on your own instance, but you're also welcome to use the Academy instance if you prefer. Does that sound correct? Yeah, that's correct. So, so please start on your own instance. 
Uh, I think the learning effect is better on your own instance because that's the one you're going to use next week. Uh, but uh, but for this first task, and that I think all of this should be possible to answer. If not, tell us and then switch over to the uh, can, the workshop instance. Mm. Thanks. So we have done with the first exercise, and then we will uh, continue on session two, which is covering the boundary and facility layers, which are the two quite easy layers to start with. Uh, so the boundary layer is this icon here. Uh, it is very useful to use just to see, look at your organization units. So of course, this requires that you have these coordinates for your organization units in your database. And we told you about this in the webinar and said you should reach out if you don't have them in your database. So right now we don't, because this is a bit complex task, it's only done once for administrators. So if you don't have the boundaries in on your DHS2 instance, I hope you have, but if you don't, you have to use the workshop instance. But then please, because this is crucial to do the thematic layers later on. So having these boundaries are very important. So if you don't have, if you have a problem with it or you don't have them, please reach out to us and we will try to help you after the workshop. We don't have time within the workshop. So in this next exercise, you need to select some of your own organization units and then you use this organization unit dialogue. So you can select uh, for the first exercise, it's just to select the first level, uh, but you can also re restrict the selection to one of the districts, uh, one of the districts uh, in your database. I also saw it was a question when you used uh, the workshop instance that you only see Sierra Leone and not your own country for data. And that is true. So the, the workshop instance, it's only Sierra Leone demo data. So you need to use that data. Uh, because we don't have access to, to the country specific data. So these are just some made of data for Sierra Leone. We have, we have tried to make them sensible, but it's no, no real data because they are protected. Uh, for boundary layer, you can also change the style. It's not a lot you can do, but you can, for example, put on the labels. So you can also see the name of the organization units uh, on the map. And then after you add the, the layer, you will see it in the left column as a, we call it a layer card. And here you can toggle the layer on and off, which is an exercise. You can change the opacity of the layer and reorder them, edit the layer instead of adding a new one. And also download the layer, which we will do tomorrow. Uh, there is also a data table. So this can be used, for example, if you want to count the number of organization units you have on your map, or you can also use it to filter. You can search for, for a search name, uh, for example. The facility layer, it's a bit similar, uh, but that instead of, that will only show point facilities, useful to show your health facilities and it will show with icons instead of, of circles or polygons as for the boundary layer. And the other option here is that you can add a buffer around it with a certain distance, for example, five or 10 kilometers. Here is 2000 meters. So you can see how, the, the, like for example, to, to see the, the coverage of the, of the health facility. So when you select a facility layer, you first need to select a facility group, which will also determine the, the icons. And then uh, you can also, you need to select the facilities in the under organization units, and you can also style it and add the buffers. So you will now try to do this yourself. Uh, last, just to mention that when you see the facilities on the map, you can right click on the facility and select show information. This is a bit hidden feature. 
but uh, you should then be able to see some data about the health facility. This you need to set up in another app, but you can check if this is already made for your instance. And if not, you can ask the system administrator to maybe add the indicators that you would like to see when right-clicking the health facility. So this is the exercise. Uh, quickly, uh, you should add a boundary layer uh, for, from your own instance. This has been supported for all versions, so you can use whatever. Uh, and then you could uh, use the first level below the national level. And then maybe use the data table to see how many org units there are on this level. Then you can try to toggle the visibility on and off of the layer without adding and removing the layer but just in the, in the left layer card. Uh, you should add labels, name of the organization to the map. And then to the same map, so you actually have two layers, you can also add uh, some facilities. Uh, so you can select all facilities in one of your districts. And then try this show information. Uh, I just show you to see what, what, will, sh what will show. And then lastly, add a 10 kilometer buffer around each health facility. And then you could maybe zoom out on the map and see if there are areas uh, that are not covered by any health facilities. And as previously, you can share your answers in the day one exercise two channel. So good luck, you now have another 15 minutes. So I will go through the exercises quickly. I've seen quite a few nice answers on Slack. So it looks like you are doing good. I see that quite a few of you are using the Sierra Leone instance. So it would be interesting for us just to have some feedback why you are not using your own instance if it's not because it's too old uh, or it's um, you don't have coordinates uh, data for your org units or other reasons. So please just tell us in the, uh, in the exercise channel too, uh, why you are using the, the Sierra Leone uh, demo. So I will quickly go through the exercises. So the first one was to add a boundary layer. So you click on add layer, select boundaries. And then for the first level, I will select district level and then add the layer. Uh, the map should automatically zoom in uh, to, to the layer or units you select. Uh, to toggle Are, the, sure. Uh, I believe I'm not seeing your screen. I don't know if other people are. Oh, okay. Sorry for that. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, uh, the first task was quite easy, so I won't uh, repeat it, but just to add uh, one boundary layer to the map. Uh, when you have added the layer, uh, you can uh, toggle it on and off uh, by uh, clicking the eye symbol here to the left. And you can also change the opacity of the layer uh, by dragging this slider. Then, you edit the layer by clicking this edit button, and then you have some more options here, for example, to see the data table in this more button here. So now we are going to edit the layer and add some labels. So then you check the labels checkbox here. Uh, I often increase the size a little bit to make them bigger, and then update the layer. And you should see the labels on the map. You can also change the opacity of the base map so the labels are more visible by turning that one down. Um, so then we are going to take add a new layer to the same map. So you can add as many layers you like. The recommendation is to add as few as possible, but it's you, you, there is there are no limits. So add a facility layer. I will select a group by facility type. And then it's important here to select the facility level 
So you need, this can be named differently for different instances, but it's important to select the level where you have your facilities. And then to restrict this to only one district, I can select the Kenema district here and then add layer. The next task is to see information about the facility. If you just hover the facility, you should see the name and the type. And then if you right click, you can select show information. And then you should get some data for this facility that you can, you can change in the system, system settings app. So this is done as part of the configuration for a system and then available for all of your users. So you can also see some data here, the code of the unit, parent unit, and the groups uh, which the unit is a member of. Uh, the last exercise was to add a buffer around each facility on 10 kilometers. So let's edit the layer and then select style and then select buffer. And then we increase this to 10,000 meters and then update the layer. So now you should see these buffers around each one. And where there is darker color, there is a higher cluster of, of health facilities. So now we added for this district. So you could see here that in the north, there are no health facilities. Uh, if people are living here, it is more than 10 kilometers to the nearest health facilities. Just uh, in, take it a little bit further. You could then add a population layer, which we will look into extensively tomorrow, but I'll just show you here. So I can add a population uh, layer. I know for this older version, I need to go back to 2010 to have number data for Sierra Leone. So try the different years and then add the layer. So one challenge now is that this layer is added on top of the other. So it sort of hides uh, the layers below, but then it's important that you can just take this layer and drag it. So you can reorder the layers to, to put it on top. So we can also place the borders on top of the, of the population layer. And then if we zoom in, we see that there seems to be some small villages here, but not a lot of people living in this area. And it's probably the reason there why there are a few health facilities in this area. But this is an example of how you can combine different layers to sort of try to understand why the situation is like it is. So that was the end of exercise two. So let's move on. So the next session is about thematic layers, which is probably the one you use the most, that one and event layer. And thematic layer is to show aggregate data for your organization units. So we have this layer has been there for a long time. It's this kind of the default standard layer of DHS2. Um, and the standard way of showing this layer is with a technique that is called a choroplat map. And uh, until 235, this was the only thematic layer visualization type we supported. But now we have also added bubble map, which I will show you shortly. But choroplat map is, um, a map where you have these predefined areas, which is your organization units that are colorized. You add a color to it in proportion to a statistical value. So this is the preferred method you would typically use to show an indicator. Uh, so what is a bit important here to remember is that you should not use this map, choroplat map, for total numbers. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, the, it should only be data that is in percent or, for, or per capita uh, because you will compare one district to another 
and if it's total numbers, you don't take into the account the number of people living there. So it could look like a region is doing worse than another region, but the reason it's not really the truth because it's just that the population is so much higher. So we call this data to be to normalized and that is quite important to use this thematic mapping technique. Then another important issue is how you classify the data. So that means how you assign colors to your OR unit from a statistical value. So, so far we support three different options. One is to have a predefined legend, which is often good to use, for example, for percentage. Uh, and then you can also add your own colors. So for example, if you consider above a certain rate or a certain percentage to be bad, for example, you could add this color red and maybe green if something is, is uh, well performing. Uh, and these uh, predefined legends are you defined in the maintenance app, not in the maps app. And these can also be used in other visualization apps like the data visualizer. And then we also support two, we call it automatic classification methods because it's not predefined, it's something that is done on the fly. And those two we support are equal intervals and equal counts. And equal intervals means that we take the lowest and the highest number for all your organization units, and then we divide it into a number of classes which all have the same size. So for example, zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15. And then each of these classes get a specific color, and then we put all of your org units or facilities into these classes. Often I prefer to use equal intervals because it might give, it will give the most, I would say, correct image of, of your situation. Because, yeah. Uh, and the other option, you, which you can also use to sort of enhance the, the view is called equal counts. And what we then do is that we take all your organization units and we make the classes based on equal number of org units in each class. So here, for example, you can see the number in small here, that it's six org units in this class. But while here, there are either three or four in each class. So that means that uh, on, in, with the equal intervals, only this one get the darkest color, but uh, using equal counts, we get three um, org units or districts having this in the same class and getting the same color. And this might, some would say, give a wrong view because these are actually behaving better and it more belongs to this class than this class. And also remember, you can also select the number of classes. So in here, there are only four, but you can also select more classes. So my recommendation is to use a, maybe a, a, either a pre, good predefined legend or equal intervals, but you could test, but just tell that uh, you should just try to, to tell the, 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 what you consider is the important and the true story behind your map while, while you select your classification. Uh, predefined legend, uh, we won't do this as an exercise because I cre I've created the exercises so you don't mess up your own, own <laughs> instance. So, but you can try this on your own to, to add more predefined legends. And then in addition to be able to create the legends, you can also assign a predefined legend to an indicator or a data element. And if you do that, that will come up as a default in the Maps app. So the users using the indicator don't need to, to make this decision because it will already, already have a predefined legend. Then from 335, we also added a bubble map because we saw that there was a limitation here, especially with the COVID uh, 
coming up where there is, was often a need to map the number of COVID cases. And then if these are not, if these are total numbers, it's not a good way to map this using a choropleth map, but then instead to use something we, we call it a bubble map, but it's often called a proportional symbol map. And the symbol you, you size in proportion to a statistical value is often a circle, and that is what we use. So here on this map, the size of the circle and the color will show the number of BCG doses given. And if the org units you select is a area or a polygon, we will just place the circle in the middle of that polygon uh, and, and in addition show the boundary so you can sort of see where these circles belong. So for thematic layer, you select the, uh, for the exercise, you select the, use the indicator, which is often normalized for choropleth map, and then you select a data element, which is often total numbers uh, to use for a bubble map. Then under period, we have also added the possibilities to, to show changes over time. So I think this is from, from 233. You, you can either show a timeline and then you can step through the time to see the changes from one month to another, for example, or you can have these split view maps where we have multiple maps on the screen at the same time. And then you can easily compare and contrast uh, the different, the different uh, months. So there is an exercise of, of doing both. And then under style is where you select between the choropleth and bubble map. And just remember choropleth is always the default, but if you select a data element, you should use rather use a bubble map. And here you also see that you can select the, the legend type and the, how the classification. So please, try and uh, and figure out by yourself and nothing bad can can happen if you just click around so this is the exercise number three uh, so the first exercise is to create a thematic map a choropleth from one of your indicators and uh, use the a predefined color legend if defined if not you just create one yourself and then I would like you to try to right click one of the org units and see how you can drill down and then drill up again between the different levels. And then exercise two, edit the same layer and switch to an automatic color legend and then try both these options, equal intervals and equal counts and see how it's affecting the map. And maybe also think about which one you, you would prefer for this particular indicator. Then number three is to create a timeline map from one of your indicators and, and then navigate between the periods. So this requires 233 DHS2 and then switch to split view map for the same indicator. And then you can compare those two. Uh, and then please tell us which one you, you prefer to use. Uh, the last task is to create a bubble map. So that requires 235. So use the demo, uh, the workshop instance, if you don't have this version and, and uh, use a data element and add it as a layer. And this one you can also download and share on our Slack channel. So good luck. Good luck again. I see you are doing good so far in the, on Slack. So, so you have 20 minutes on this. Then this one is a bit, little bit more complicated. So you will have 20 minutes. So we can stop the recording. Exercise was to create a choropleth map uh, with the default predefined legend. So I go to add layer, select thematic, select, I will just select A and C 
um, the first indicator, ANC1 coverage. And often this should be enough to create a map because there is a default period selected, which you can change in your system settings. What should be the default period? Uh, there, the default is also to select the first level below national level for all units. And for style, if there is a predefined legend defined for this indicator, it will also automatically be selected. So here we use ANC1 coverage and then add layer. So this is the map. Uh, what you can do is to right click here. So you, and then you can drill down and up. So if you want to see how is this situation within this district, you can click drill down and it will only show the chiefdoms in this district. And you can continue down all the way down to facility level and see their performance. And then we can drill up again, all the way up to the level where we were at the beginning. Uh, next, we can change to automatic legend. So we edit the layer, go to style and select automatic color legend. And then we can select between equal intervals and equal counts, which I explained. So if you try equal intervals, update the layer, the map will look like this. Uh, the gaps, like the, the size of each of these five classes should be the same. And then you can see the count, how many org units are within each class in, in behind it. So if there is only one uh, in the highest class. And as you saw also in the predefined legend, I guess if this is percentage, these numbers will look wrong. So they said that everything above a certain threshold uh, was colored green. So that is not something you get when you use the automatic legend. Uh, that, that will take the minimum and the highest number and then divide the classes in between. So uh, at least now we see that there is one in the sort of, uh, I guess, best performing class, uh, bo bo. And if we change this to equal counts, there should be an equal number uh, within each of these classes, but the size of this class will be, will be different. So you will see it doesn't divide evenly up. So there is some with three and others with, with two. Uh, so then we want to see this as a timeline map. So right now we are looking at the last 12 months. If we go to period and if we reduce the numbers a bit or the months to only to six months. And then if you select timeline, it will take each of these six months and make individual maps and then add a timeline. So we select timeline, update the layer and you will see month by month down here. And then you can click on what you will also see is that there are some months where there is no data for some org units and they will show up at blank fields. If you prefer to have this as gray, for example, you can click edit, style, and then show no data. And then you can select the color uh, for these when there is no data. So we, I say, take the default gray and then update the layer. And then this will still show on the map but with no data. So with this timeline, you can click on the play button and it will basically loop through the different months and you can see the changes. And you can also click directly on the timeline to see how it differs from one month to another. So this is one view to see changes over time. The other method is to go to period and select split view maps. And then instead of showing one map at a time, this will split your screen and show all six maps at the same time. And these are also synchronized. So when you navigate the map or even if you drill down one level, it will all happen to the same, same maps. So you can easily compare them all the way. 
So, and personally, I see that quite a few of you actually like the timeline view better. Uh, my preference is this. Of course, it makes the map smaller, but uh, here you can, because you can see the maps at the same time from different periods, I feel it's easier to compare and contrast uh, the different uh, methods. But you have both options and, um, and please use them. Uh, the last exercise was to create a bubble map. So let's go to new and then use instead of an indicator, you should use a data element. So I will select immunization. It's a long list here. And then BCG doses given. And then as this one is selected by default, we might change this in future versions. So if you select a data element, bubble map will be the default choice. But right now you need to remember to switch here. And then you can decide to have the same color legend as before, or you can just use a single color. So I will do that. And then add a layer. And then this size of this circle will be in proportion to the number of doses given. If you click on it, you will see the, the value. Uh, you can also change the size of this. So you can increase up to 50, the radius. So the circles will be bigger. So you can see it also depends on your screen size, what, what will fit. So that was the exercises for thematic layers. Good work. And then I will hand over to Austin. Sure, thanks, Brian. I will share my screen. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. And hopefully you see the presentation. Um, so I'm going to go over the next layer type that we have in the maps application. Um, I'm actually going to go over two in a row, um, but spend most of the time on, on the one that probably most people have more data for, and that is for the event layer. Um, events are for um, viewing individual uh, things that happen. So an event happens at a particular place. Uh, and each event corresponds to a single point uh, on the map for where that event took place. And we'll talk about how to use the maps application to visualize that kind of type of data uh, in a moment. So to create a, an event layer, we have uh, just as we've created the other layer types, there's an event um, uh, option when you add a layer. Um, and the main thing that you'll need to select when you're creating an event layer is a program. Uh, you need to select which program you want to visualize. Uh, in this case, I've selected inpatient morbidity and mortality, um, and that's number of people that have uh, passed away in a hospital, for instance, or, or in a health facility. Um, and there are some other options here. We won't get into too much, but there are other options for selecting what type of, uh, what field of that data that you would like to use to determine the location. In most cases, there is a location associated with the event itself, but in some uh, instances, you might have your, your location data somewhere else in the data element, for instance. Um, there are additionally a number of options that are very similar. So you'll see that this is now the, we're looking at the last tab for the event layer creation dialogue. Uh, in, this in this tab, we have uh, options for styling the, the event layer, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but the other tabs here, the period, org unit, and filter, are similar to what uh, Bjorn just demonstrated for the uh, thematic layer. So I'm not going to go over those uh, as well. But you can select the period, the um, organization unit that you would like to view, and the uh, a filter to determine which data you want to um, uh, you want to show and which you want to exclude from those events. For styling the event layer, there are a number of options. Um, the main one on the on the left there with the two images um, is to select whether to group the events together into circles or what are called clusters, um, or to show all of them on the map at the same time. And there are a number of reasons why you might want to choose one of these versus the other. One of the exercises is to think about that and figure out why, why you might want to use uh, grouped events versus viewing all events. But one thing to keep in mind is that in 235, 
the rendering engine for the maps application, which means the, the way that they are drawn into your browser was changed to make it possible to view many, many more events at the same time. So if you're using a version that is before 235, you might have trouble if you have a lot, a lot of events and you select the view all events option here. Um, in the 235, it should be possible to download uh, a, a large number of events, up to hundreds of thousands even, uh, and still show all of those in the, in the screen, uh, on the screen. Um, but if you're using uh, before 235, that might be slow and might be, might be hard to use. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're going through the exercises. There are a number of other options here. The, the, the second main one uh, is style by data element, which is on the right side. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, but this allows you to basically select between um, different, uh, yeah, based on a data element for a particular event program, you can select whether to color those points on the map one way or another. So in this case, we've selected gender and we're going to show all of the male events that are associated with a male in blue and all of the events that are associated with the female in orange. Um, there are many more um, sophisticated ways to use this style by data element. This is the most simple because it just has two options and two colors, blue and yellow, or blue and, blue and orange. Um, we'll get into how to use a legend for that as well later. Um, and then we'll, you'll note that you can also, if you're not using style by data element, you can select a color for all of your points. And you can also assign a, a, a radius or a size to those points as well. Um, the buffer option here is uh, similar to the one that was shown for facilities, um, but you'll notice that it's grayed out here. And that's because we've selected group events. So if you select group events, you can't use a buffer because the events are grouped. Um, but if you select view all events, you should be able to, to assign a buffer to each of those points. If you select a style by data element that is uh, something other than a Boolean, so it doesn't just have two options or two or three specific options, it's not, a, not necessarily a Boolean, but has a, a certain values. So in the, in the previous case, we had two options. One is male and one is female, and there's no number associated with that. However, if you have a number associated with a particular data element, for instance, age and years, so this is, the age of the, the person that was recorded uh, for this event. Um, you can then choose a legend in the same way that you would with the thematic layer that, that Bjorn demonstrated. Uh, you can choose similarly a predefined legend, which is defined in the maintenance application. Um, we won't get into too much today, but if you have a predefined legend associated with a uh, particular data element or type of data, then you can use that. And you can also create a, a, an on-the-fly or automatic legend, uh, which has classifications of equal interval or equal count, similar to um, the way you define that in the thematic layer. This is an example of a large uh, set of data. This is more than 100,000 events um, for the malaria case registration program in the demo database. And you can see here that we're also doing a style by data element and have selected view all events. So we're actually showing all 100,000 events at the same time when you're looking at the entire country of Sierra Leone. And we're turning, changing the color for each of those points on the map to be either blue or orange, depending on the gender of the person that was recorded for that particular event. Um, again, remember that this might be very slow before 235. So would recommend not using this view all events option for very large sets of events if you're not using 235, but you're welcome to use the demo instance to test that as well. If you select group events, we have what's called uh, donut clusters, which was uh, introduced, I believe in 235 as well. Um, Bjorn, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I believe that was 235. I'll go back and look at the, look at the chart. Um, and this is similar to the, the groups that we saw um, in the first slide where you had uh, a number, which is the number of events that happened in a particular region. Uh, and this allows you to see from, from the national level, you can kind of see the groupings of events in different areas, but you don't see the individual point of exactly where each of those events happened. 
And this is much more performant in um, situations where you have a lot of events. So it means that if you have 100,000 events, you don't need to download all 100,000 and show them all on the map. You instead get a, uh, uh, a much lighter amount of data that you need to download to show where in each region you have a, a, a group of, of events and how many of there are there. Um, you can do this in all versions back to uh, maybe even before two, it was before 2.30 that the grouping was introduced. Um, but the uh, style by data element being applied to a group of events was introduced in, in a later version in 2.35. Um, and that basically means that instead of just seeing a black circle with 215 in this uh, example, you see 215, but with different, um, uh, different colors around the outside. And those colors represent the, the legend that we see on the left of our screen here and, and shows of these 215 events, how many are associated with a person between zero and 15 years of age, between 75 and 90 years of age, and all the other categories that are associated with, um, with our legend. Uh, this is called donut clusters, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about that later. This is just another example of a predefined legend with a large number of events and style by data element, or sorry, an automatic legend um, with style by data element and a large number of events. And in this case, we're viewing all events. So you can see between these two uh, that there's a bit of a difference in what type of, what, what you're able to see from a, from a very high uh, viewpoint. So looking at the entire country, you can see different information or, or interpret different information when you see all the points individually versus when you see all of the points grouped together. Another feature of the events layer is the data table, which is similar to what uh, Bjorn introduced as well. Um, but it's a bit uh, different for the events layer because you have a lot of individual events rather than clusters for each organization unit, or sorry, um, uh, thematic groups for each organization unit. Uh, you get to this data table by clicking the dot, dot, dot next to the layer on the left side of your screen and clicking on data table. That will open up this uh, data table down on the bottom half of your screen. Uh, and then you can, uh, as similar to the thematic layer you can, or, or the um, boundary layer, sorry, you can uh, type values into these search fields and filter the data in the table as well as on the map. Um, you can filter here. You can also see the information that is being associated uh, with each of these events. So for instance, you see the age and years for each of the events that are um, recorded uh, and what, what the age and the gender of that person was who, who uh, was the, the recipient of this, or, or sorry, was the uh, exhibiting malaria symptoms in this case. That's a, a quick overview of the event layer. We'll have, a, have an exercise that goes over both event and a little bit of tracked entity layers. Um, a lot of times there's, um, you need to be careful because you, in order to use an event layer or a tracked entity layer, you need to be collecting uh, point data or, point, or polygon data. So basically a geometry or a, a location for the events and the tracked entities that you are entering into your system. So in some instances, you might not have any data for the location on these events. So it might look like there are no events in the system, but that could be just because you're not collecting the location where that event is happening in your event program or in your tracker program. Um, so if you don't have that, that information of where that's happening, we, you can't show it on a map. And you might need to change the metadata for your particular DHS2 instance in order to collect that information. The second uh, type of uh, layer in this kind of group is tracked entities. It's very similar to events, and you can it can look a lot like an event layer. Uh, however, it's going to be using tracker data rather than uh, event uh, data in DHS2. Um, you're going to use tracker programs instead of event programs. Uh, and you can see uh, that you select similar things in, in, this, in this dialogue. Um, but there are a couple things that are different. 
Um, this is what an event layer looks like, or sorry, a tracked entity layer looks like. It's very similar to an event layer in, in, in many ways, but you're actually um, viewing tracker, uh, tracked entities rather than um, uh, kind of anonymous events. One thing that you can do in the tracked entity layer that you cannot do in the event layer is to visualize relationships. Uh, and this is a relatively um, uh, new feature. So it's, a, a, it's not, um, a, it, there are definitely more things that we could do with the relationship in the future, but I'm gonna demonstrate what can be done with uh, the tracked entity layer today. Uh, and this tracked entity layer with relationships, I believe was introduced in 2.30 um, and relationship maybe were added in 2.31. So I'll go back and look at that. Um, uh, slide again to see which layers, which which versions were available, had this available. Um, if you go to the relationships tab and you select display tracked entity relationships, assuming that your tracker program has a relationship associated with it or a relationship type associated with it, you can select that relationship type. And then you will see not only all of the individual tracked entities, but also a line connecting the, the entities that are related to each other. Uh, and this works um, quite well within a single program. So if you have a, uh, for instance, an index case uh, associated with a contact um, or sorry, a, a positive case associated with a contact in the case of COVID-19 or in the case of malaria uh, or other, other types of programs, you might have um, uh, other types of relationships. Um, you can visualize this uh, also across programs. So you can see, for instance, from a malaria focus area, which is not a person, but it's a, a focus area that is a tracked entity modeled in DHIS2 in this case. Um, and that might be associated with several cases of malaria. Uh, and you can see the, the relationships there as well across different programs. So malaria uh, entities are a uh, one program in DHS2 in this case, and focus areas are another program in DHS2. So now I'm going to introduce the uh, exercise here today, and you'll have again 25 minutes to to look at this because there's a, quite a bit more to do with event layers uh, than some of the other layers. Um, in you can again use your own DHS2 instance or use the one on the workshop uh, provided by the workshop, uh, which the, the login details are there. Um, and that is a 235 in instance, which you will need for exercise or part four uh, and maybe part two of this exercise. Um, because those uh, part four requires that you have 235 and part two, if you have a large number of events, you might not be able to view them all um, in uh, 233 or 232 uh, because it might be very slow. So if you are looking at a very large number of events and you find that it's very slow, um, I would recommend using a 235 instance um, that the, is provided with the Academy as well. Um, in, to solve the, this um, exercise, uh, first we're going to create an event layer from one of the programs in your instance. Uh, and I would recommend trying to select a program with a large number of events. Um, you can use malaria case registration on the demo server, which as, as we've seen has uh, about 100,000 events associated with it. Um, first, you, I would recommend adding the layer. First, you're going to add the layer with the uh, default settings, um, which has uh, clustering enabled. Uh, and then I would like you to zoom in and out uh, on that map to see how the clusters change as you're, as you're zooming in and out of the map. Then for part two, you're going to edit that layer and change from viewing the groups or clusters of events to viewing all the events at the same time, taking into remembering that this might be slow on uh, versions less than 235, 234, apologies. Um, and so you should uh, add, uh, yeah, should use the, the demo instance if you have a very large number of events. Um, there are some questions there that you can respond to as well. And then part three is to uh, create a new map with another event layer uh, and select a program this time which has some interesting data elements. If you're using the demo instance, you can use inpatient morbidity and mortality uh, and then use the select by data element feature, uh, style by data element feature to um, uh, update the, the colors of the different uh, points or the different uh, events in that layer. 
um, and try both view all and group events to see what is different for you. Um, I would then try, try the same thing with a different data element or legend and notice what changes. Um, and part four here is going to be to, from that same la layer, open the data table, uh, filter by one of the columns and notice how the map data on the map changes. Um, try to create a map that is meaningful. So it has some meaningful filtering, some meaningful style by data element um, uh, selected, uh, and then post a, a, a saved um, map or a screenshot of that uh, map that you've created to the, sorry, this should be day one exercise four um, channel. I will, I will change that in a minute. Um, then finally, uh, create, if you have a tracker program with geometries and relationships, create a tracked entity layer and display those relationships on the map. Um, and you can use the malaria case registration and the index case uh, relationship type on the demo server. So you have 25 minutes for this exercise, I believe. Um, I think that's about right. And uh, feel free to go ahead and get started. I think maybe 20 minutes. Um, and we will be back in a bit. Feel free to ask any questions you have on Slack. Thank you. Bjorn, did I miss anything there? Uh, no, I think that was fine. Uh, I see some uh, are saying that it's the, they don't can't access the data. So just remember that for the event layer, it's only two of the programs where there is actually data. Uh, the inpatient mobility and mortality, uh, I think it's called, and the malaria case registration. So use one of those two. Yeah, good point. And there may be cases in your own instances where you need to select different org units or different periods um, uh, to, to find a program with data that is meaningful. Um, and also maybe uh, make sure that your, um, your DHS2 user has access to that event program and the data for the particular org unit that you're looking at. Best of luck with the exercise and let us know if you have any questions. Do this here. Oops. Apologies. So here we have the event, uh, the maps application in the demo instance. I'm going to go ahead and re refresh my page here to make sure I'm logged in, uh, and I am logged in as the admin user, um, which we is the user that we shared um, with everyone here today. Um, if you created another user or you're logged in as a different user or you're on your own instance, you may experience different uh, behavior with the events layer because of the permissions for that user. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and do this as the admin user today. And the admin user uh, for a short time today also didn't have permission for some of these programs, which was changed. So thank you for the person that went in and fixed that. Um, and you should all now be able to use the admin user to create an event layer. Uh, with these programs. So I'm going to go ahead and create an event layer here. The first um, part of this exercise, if we go here today, I'm sorry. Um, the first part of this exercise was to um, create an event layer from one of our event programs uh, and select one with a large number of events and then add that with the default settings uh, and, and then zoom in and out. So I'm going to go ahead and select this malaria case registration, uh, which we know has a lot of uh, events. I'm going to keep the default settings here for grouping grouping those events and visualizing them on the map uh, as clusters. So here we, we create that layer. You see on the left here we have this malaria case registration layer for the last 12 months. Um, we have lots of uh, events here. You can see that these are all um, have a K or most of them have a K at the end of the number. Um, if you're not familiar, that's, that stands for 1,000. So this means 2.4 thousand events are in this cluster, um, whereas this one up here at the top has two events. Um, you can then zoom in and out. So if I, um, just to make this very clear, I'm going to use the zoom tool on the right-hand side uh, and I will zoom in. And you can see that the clusters change. So as we zoom in, um, if we still had the just the clusters that we saw at the highest zoom level or the, the looking at the whole country, it wouldn't be very helpful because you would zoom all the way in and you would see still see two and a half thousand or 
10,000 uh, points that are all kind of in, in a big group. So as we zoom in, these clusters get smaller and we see more and more detail and we see more and more where these events are located in this particular um, program, event program. So if we zoom all the way in here, eventually we will start to see these individual points. So we'll sti we still see some clusters. Um, these clusters are much smaller. So instead of thousands of events in one cluster, we have uh, two, three, five, that type of thing. And then there are ones without any number. And these are the, the events themselves. Um, so as you're zooming in and out, you can see this, uh, these clusters changing. Um, so that when you're at a high level, you can see the, the general trend of where the big groups of clusters are. And when you zoom all the way in, you can see the individual points. Um, one thing to note also, which is another feature of the event layer, similar to some of the other um, layers, but you can actually click on this event. You don't right click, you just left click. Uh, and you'll see that this has a uh, location, the age and years, the, the data elements that were collected when this event was, um, was entered uh, here as well. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it for that uh, first part of that exercise. Uh, I'm now going to jump over to one moment. I'm going to do the second workshop or second exercise of this um, uh, set of exercises here. And that is to change from group events to view all events um, so that we can just see what's, what's different between grouped, grouped events and uh, viewing them all. So if I go back to uh, this here, um, we're going to go ahead and click uh, edit. So on the left here, we have the edit button. You can also uh, click the dot, dot, dot and click edit layer. Going to go to the style tab and I'm going to change from group events to view all events. That's the only thing I'm going to change here. Um, you'll see, as I mentioned earlier, when you're in the group events, you can't add a buffer because a, a buffer on a group of events doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you click view all events, then you'll see that you can actually add a buffer with a radius for those events as well, if you would like. Uh, we're not going to do that today. So we're just going to change from group events to view all events, click update layer. And this takes much longer, you'll notice. So that was something that a lot of people saw right off the bat is this takes much longer to load. Um, this is again, viewing 100,000 points um, at the same time, which could be very slow in some browsers, but from 234, and I said, I said incorrectly previously that this was from 235, but from 234, we've had uh, a feature called WebGL, which makes this much, much faster and easier to see um, so many points uh, on the same map. So if you zoom in and out, it may, be, it may look uh, kind of laggy on, um, or, or slow or jerky on your uh, Zoom uh, screen, but I can assure you that this is very smooth. Uh, and you should be able to visualize that um, in your own uh, browser as well. Um, and you can also see from this that uh, we, we load all of these points once, and that takes a little bit of time, quite a bit of time potentially if there are a large number of events. But once they're on the map, it should be easy to zoom in and out and see the data for these individual points as well. So I'm going to now uh, go on, move on to the next um, layer here. Some people, uh, or next exercise, some people were mentioning um, uh, the part of the exercise that said, why would you want to view uh, events in this way versus viewing them with the, uh, the grouping turned on, the, the clusters? Um, and that it's, there are a number of reasons that you might want both. So in this case, you can see the the kind of groupings in, into an area, uh, maybe in a little bit of a better way than if you had um, the numbers in the clusters, but it's much less performance, so it might be not as fast. And also, it's, it's hard to see how, really how many points are, there are over in these areas where there's lots and lots of different uh, points on top of each other. So when you have clusters, you can see that there might be 5,000 in this area rather than just seeing a bunch of points on top of each other and not knowing if that's 100 or 5,000. Um, so the next part of this exercise, we are going to uh, create a new layer with a, um, uh, back here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new map. So I'm going to go file new. I'm going to add a new event layer. 
and I'm gonna select the inpatient morbidity and mortality program. Um, and I'm going to select style by data element. So uh, first I'll keep the grouped events here and I will we'll select, um, let's say uh, height in centimeters. I think this one has some data. Uh, we're gonna do an automatic legend off the bat with five equal interval um, uh, categories. I'm gonna go ahead and click add. And you'll see here that uh, there actually are some, some bad data in this program. Um, so it's important to, to recognize this in your own progr programs or in your own uh, databases that this is uh, what, what's called null island that um, Bjorn mentioned earlier today. This is at zero, zero, the point zero, zero. So somebody, when they were entering this event data into this program, they put zero, zero as the coordinates. Um, but that's obviously not where this event actually took place. There's, there's nothing there. It's in the middle of the ocean. Um, so it's important to note that there might be some data issues in your programs if people are entering the coordinates incorrectly. You might also have cases where someone put switched latitude and longitude when they were entering the, that data. And they, uh, so it ends up instead of in Sierra Leone, it might be uh, somewhere on the other side of the, this central point, which might be somewhere over in uh, Greece, for instance. But for now, we're going to look at just the, the points that are in um, uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, and we see that we have a, a inpatient morbidity and mortality um, based, we're disaggregating based on height, which may not be the most interesting thing, but maybe there's some correlation between um, morbidity and height that we, that we want to investigate. Um, and we can see that the vast majority of people in uh, this region, for instance, um, ha are in the 101 to 131 centimeters uh, category, which maybe is maybe is incorrect, but um, that this is demo, de demo data, so it's been um, kind of uh, created um, and isn't doesn't reflect reality. But if we look at this, we can see that this is uh, has a larger proportion of people in that particular um, height range, and we can zoom in and see more information and click on individual points and get data about the, um, let's look at this one here, and get data about the height and centimeters of this particular case. Um, now we're going to move on to the next exercise. And the next exercise was, uh, oh, we, sorry, for this, for this exercise as well, we wanted to also see the same data, but viewing it uh, with all events rather than as clusters. So we're now gonna look at this with all events. And here we can see the individual height uh, of each of these events rather than uh, viewing them as clusters. We can also change the legend and see what changes there. I'm gonna go ahead and edit this, change this to a predefined color legend with height and centimeters as the predefined legend set, update the layer. And now we have uh, well-defined zero to 100, and then 100 to 120, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which allows us to have a better, a better kind of disaggregation of these height values. Next up, we are going to open the data table and view uh, all of this data. So let's go ahead and click dot, 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 open the data table. You'll see down here at the bottom, we have the data table here now. Uh, and you, we can see that we have not only the color, but also the uh, age and years, the height and centimeters, the mode of discharge, et cetera, um, of these particular people. Um, and we can do some filtering on this data. So for instance, we want all of the people that are over 120 uh, uh, centimeters in height, um, or let's say over 150. So these are all the people that are 150 centimeters and older or over uh, and the where they exist on the map. And because we're looking at this uh, data uh, without any clustering, we, we can see all of those points. And if I make this even more um, uh, restrictive, if we have only the people that are over 180 centimeters in height uh, or the people that are over, uh, there are no people over two meters apparently uh, in this demo data. But if there was people over 180 centimeters in height, um, we can see that there are not as many um, as there are total um, values here. 
so this might be something interesting if you want to see the number of people with a height in centimeters over 180 in this inpatient morbidity and mortality program. Uh, you could save this, uh, this map and send it to someone. Now we're going to look at the last uh, part of this um, exercise, which is to uh, look at the tracked entity layer. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. And, yes. Could we take this in the Q&A section as, as we're running sure. a little bit out of time? Sure. Yep. Um, so the yeah the the last bit was the uh, tracked entity layer. Um, hopefully, some of you got a chance to look at that, and we will cover the, that in the Q and A session. Go ahead, uh, Bjorn. Sure. Uh, over to you. Uh, I will share my screen. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, we, uh, since uh, the Q&A section is optional, I just want to finish off today the compulsory part. And, um, and then I hope, just hope most of you will join us for the Q&A session. We still have an, uh, an hour to answer your questions. Um, and we will also cover some of the Google Earth engine and the new stuff in, in the latest Maps app in the Q&A section. But for now, uh, this is the quote of the day. So to prove that you have been taking part of this uh, first day of this workshop, uh, you need to write this down in the form that is, uh, that is shared in the announcements channel. I love DHS too. Okay. Uh, I will cover, say a little bit about Google Earth Engine layers uh, in the Q&A session just after. Uh, we will also have a full day working on population data tomorrow. So that will be very well covered. So a brief summary from today's workshop. So you should have seen that it's quite easy to create maps from your own health data. Uh, and that thematic layer is the layer you should use for aggregate data and then data about individuals, you have event and tracked entity layers. Then I will show you in a few minutes for those who, is, who are still here, how you can aggregate data from external sources uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, I see that quite a few of you have used the data table and uh, I think that's a very powerful way of quickly being able to filter the data as the map is instantly updating when you are adding the filters. So it's a quite easy way to sort of drill down and, and uh, see patterns in your data. And also remember we have not covered this because again I didn't want to destroy your instance so we haven't been saving and adding maps to the dashboard but you can do this as you already can with your other visualization types. So please test this yourself uh, on your own instance. When you create a map, remember to save it and add it to a dashboard. Uh, and tomorrow we will look into how you can export data from the Maps app to, to other applications. And all, as always, uh, check the user documentation. We try to keep that up to date for all new versions. So, so please use the user documentation. Tomorrow we have a very exciting setup. So we have the director from WorldPop who will come and present their data sets, which are very high detail down to 100 by 100 meters population data from for most of the world. And what we will do is that we will import this data together with your organization units from your own country or health facilities to a program called QGIS. And then we will combine these two layers and check how many people live within your org unit boundaries or around a health facility. And if time, we will also look at driving distance because just having a buffer around a facility is maybe not so interesting, but you can have even a driving or walking distance. Let's see how many people uh, that health facility is covering. So for those who are leaving us now, welcome back tomorrow. 
uh, we'll meet again at the same time, 10 o'clock Central European time. And um, the rest of us will have a five minute break. And then we will meet back here on this uh, same Zoom for a Q&A. And if you already know some questions, you can feel free to ask them in the questions channel on, on Slack. So we'll meet again in five minutes. Some of you are the rest we will see. Thank you and see you again tomorrow. Thank you.